All right. All right, all right, all right. What's up, y'all? All All right, welcome to my talk, IoT Under the Microscope, here uh, virtually. It's kind of disappointing. Uh, I'm looking at a screen here instead of all you in the in the audience, but uh, hopefully we'll get through this and we'll have a good time doing it. Um, I want to talk about vulnerability trends in the supply chain. Um, I've got some uh, very interesting things I think that we found in our in our data set size. So hopefully you guys will learn something here and we'll have a little fun while doing it. All right. Okay. So who am I? I'm Parker Wixel. Um, I'm born and raised here in Columbus, Ohio. I've got 25 years industry experience on um, cybersecurity, on software development, full uh, full stack development. Uh, last 10 years of which have really been focused on cybersecurity research and product development. Um, I was a contributor and developer of open source security projects like uh, AFL Unicorn. It's a fuzzing framework for emulated uh, binaries and then patchwork which is a uh, compilation, a static compilation of Linux kernels or patching of Linux kernels for debugging purposes. Um, uh, like it was mentioned, I'm a senior engineer at Finite State. We're a IoT cybersecurity firm um, dealing with a lot of the topics that we're talking about here and all my data sets and stuff like that come from our Finite State uh, repos and some of the products that we're working on here. I'm also a database lecturer over at the Ohio State University. Uh, looking to cook, kick off yet another fall there. And then I'm a composer and a musician. Um, don't hold that against me. Um, I realize early on that um, uh, there's not a lot of money in music. So here I am on just another passion of mine, computers. All right. So why is this talk relevant to your interests? We're going to be talking about supply chain trends, vulnerable and not vulnerable, uh, vulnerability standards and reporting, and then some firmware statistics and observations. Um, Probably about the first half of the talk is going to be delving into the background of what supply chains are, some of the uh, ways that we have to talk about vulnerabilities, what the supply chain introduces as far as vulnerabilities and uh, visibility into those. And then probably the last half will be delving into the fun numbers, uh, probably why you came to see this talk. But nevertheless, hopefully we learn something in both, uh, both parts. Okay, so our data set that uh, that I'm pulling from right now, uh, we do have partnerships with some um, private industry uh, partners. So we do not include all of our private repos and stuff like that. But um, for this particular talk, I've got about 7 million files, represents about 50,000 firmware images, uh, 10,000 distinct product lines and uh, 150 different vendors. Um, This is uh, different architectures, different operating systems. You know, a lot of them are Linux uh, based. A lot of, um, some of them are RTOS obviously. Um, And we're hitting all the different verticals that you usually hear about in these talks, Uh, medical devices, uh, critical infrastructure, security devices, home routers, um, Alexa, you know, whatever. Uh, we've got a bunch of different types of products in our data set. So hopefully the statistics that we talk about here on the second half, um, to keep this in mind, uh, it's it's fun to be able to troll a data set of this size. Okay. So let's take a step back. Let's talk about the supply chain. Let's talk about the problems um, that are introduced as a part of the supply chain and what the problems are. Maybe even go into some of the solutions. All right. All right. So if you are a manufacturer XYZ of a security camera, that security camera is running some sort of firmware on it. Um, there, there's hardware and there's firmware. The firmware is actually software that's written for that hardware device. We like to think of it as firmware because it's kind of baked in. It's usually not as fluid or as dynamic as software tends to be in, say, a PC or whatever. But um, the camera still has a full processor, memory, architecture, it's a full computer running in that thing. So if you can take advantage of that or take over that product from a vulnerability standpoint, you've accessed a whole computer's worth of resources. You have hardware components that go in the thing. You have drivers that talk to those hardware's operating systems, libraries, apps, you name it. They're all just the same 
um, except they're called firmware. The problem is on a uh, security camera like this or any kind of IoT device is you're going to have multiple vendors. So if you're company XYZ, you're making this product, um, the, those hardware components may come from various different vendors, all right? And then there may be other vendors like vendor A who talks to your underlying camera optics and can put, you know, some image recognition on top of it or whatever else like that. Vendor B may be some support, um, some support libraries or whatever. The real problem comes in is not only do you have to track vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, and what all they're putting onto your device, which uh, quite frankly is not always the case. Uh, there's not always full disclosure there. But then vendor A and vendor B may rely on an open source library somewhere, vendor X, that you don't even know about. Um, they may or may not even know that they're using it, depending on if their developers have reported on it. Um, and the, the thing that makes that even worse is that vendor X library, say it's the same um, low level image processing library, um, it may be version 1.1 in vendor A and vendor B in their libraries that they're including on your device has 1.5. Maybe vendor A's 1.1 version of vendor X has a vulnerability in it and the 1.5 version doesn't. How do you know what all component libraries you have in this simple camera. This is a full computer running on your network, right? Um, so uh, Donald Rumsfeld, when he was Secretary of Defense, um, brought to this notion together that information can be divided into three categories, he said at the time, known knowns, known unknowns, no unknown unknowns, all right? And so we take that kind of approach towards IoT vulnerabilities. Um, are known knowns, are vulnerabilities that have explicitly been discovered through scanning and testing on our devices. So we've tested it, we know that there's a vulnerability, we patch it or whatever like that. So that's our known knowns, all right? Our known unknowns are newly created software versions or, or, um, or even just upgraded versions or whatever that we've pulled in libraries or whatever that we don't have any kind of application testing behind yet, right? So who knows? Uh, what is going on under the hood there. So we know the device, we just don't know if there's any vulnerabilities there. And then in, in the last categorization of the three, unknown unknowns are vulnerabilities that are in your camera or your device that you don't know and that nobody else knows. And these are what we're calling zero days, all right? So these zero days or uh, not zero days because we, um, we haven't even discovered them, um, like, say, Ripple 20. Ripple 20 was just discovered a month or two ago. Before then, uh, it was an unknown unknown. It was in all these different devices, but nobody knew it was there. But the weakness was still there waiting to be discovered. All right. So there's an awful lot of work to be done in discovering zero days. As a security researcher, we know that trying to protect yourself and to get through all that is really uh, is really a challenge trying to find out what your what is vulnerable or not. So um, for this talk, we're going to talk about known or unknown knowns. This is a fourth dimension that we like to talk about, and it's comprising that which we intentionally refuse to acknowledge that we know or we don't like to know. Okay, so that there are vulnerabilities that are known to exist but have not been associated with all the systems that are actually affected. So we know all these CVEs are against this open SSL library, but we don't know if that SSL library is in our device, so we're just going to kind of ignore it for now, all right? Um, so this unknown knowns is where um, we can do an awful lot on our part as manufacturers or security researchers to ferret out and to discover and to patch before um, other actors out there find those same vulnerabilities and test them against your same device, okay? So all of that can be done through a software bill of materials. So a software bill of materials or an SBOM um, is, uh, there's a bill of materials that usually comes in the manufacturing world that they're very used to of all the components that make up um, certain devices. So if you're getting um, big printing presses or whatever else like that, you know all the pieces that make up that printing press, so you can plan maintenance. You know, all, you know what the cost is going to be up front. So, as a industry, software industry, uh, IoT industry, 
we should have the same thing, the software built in the, of materials, but we don't, all right? So uh, manufacturers don't know all their components, all the different chips, um, system on chips that are running inside their devices, all that kind of stuff. Vendors don't know all their suppliers and their supplier suppliers because a lot of times vendors will make a product, but then they'll ship it off to a manufacturer to actually make for them. Um, and so how do you validate that, you know, the, that things are exactly as you designed them or whatever? And then consumers, uh, those of us who put these devices in our critical infrastructure, into our security systems, into our monitoring software, or our monitoring networks, uh, even in our homes, uh, we put these devices into our networks but we don't know all the software that's running on those devices. So the analogy is like, if you found uh, a laptop out in the parking lot of, of your company or whatever, would you bring that laptop in, fire it up, boot it up, and plug it into your critical infrastructure security system network just to poke around on the laptop and see what's running on it? And I would hope that, most of you or all of you would say, no, there's not a chance that you would ever do that um, because we know that those are full computer systems with operating systems that can be compromised with viruses, um, malicious uh, software, etc. But yet with that exact same mentality, we don't apply to IoT devices. We'll take a camera that we do not know all the supply, you know, all the software that's running on and all the weaknesses that might be inherent on those softwares. And we'll take that camera and we'll plug that same camera into and talk to it on our critical infrastructure network. All right. So we don't have, uh, we don't have any way to enumerate this. So how do we generate one of these software bill of materials reliably? How do we keep track of all those? Um, say it was even possible to keep track of all the components that are in there, how do we validate one of our devices against one? So we as manufacturers may even develop a device and we might know exactly what we want on it, but if we send it away and it comes back, who's to say that whoever made that device for us put our firmware on there exactly as it was intended and they didn't slip something else in? Um, the, the other thing would be, um, and this has happened, is if you, as a consumer, have a device and you want to update it to the latest update patch, say there's a security vulnerability and you want to patch it, you go to the manufacturer or the vendor's site and you download the update for that firmware and you flash your device with that firmware, how do you know that software wasn't compromised. We have seen in the industry places where upload servers have been compromised by uh, malicious actors and custom firmware has been placed in there as updates and customers have downloaded malicious updates to their devices, which might have been perfectly fine in the first place, but now are running malicious software. So not only generating a software bill of materials, but validating against a bill of materials is critical and being able to do that. All right. So let's shift away. Um, um, one thing I'd like to, to mention about company commitment and stuff like that is uh, I just read uh, Microsoft has a product, Azure Sphere, that they're developing that's a secure IoT chip, and it's one way of approaching it. Hey, let's control the um, let's control the ecosystem from the beginning and secure it down. And they've made uh, commitments to the software bill of material. So it would be nice if more companies could be able to control their environment, such as Microsoft has the luxury to do. Um, and I think these kind of commitments are going to be our way forward, is following uh, practices like this, generating our own software bill materials, taking a hard look at what's running on that. All right. So let's switch to today. We have these devices. We don't know what's running on them. Let's look at the CVE CPE reporting mechanisms that we have for finding vulnerabilities in our software. Okay. So CVEs, common vulnerability exposures. Um, it's a system that, uh, provides reference methods for publicly known information security vulnerabilities and exposures, okay? So it's been around a while. Um, MITRE is the one who, who came up with that and, and helped maintains that. So these are all the vulnerabilities that are discovered and reported for public knowledge, right? So that's great. We have a central place to report vulnerabilities. As well, we have a national vulnerability database with the U.S. government that keeps track of CPEs, or Common Platform Enumeration. So this is a, a structured naming schemes for naming products, okay? This is systems, softwares, software packages, et cetera. Um, 
So there's a common way to put all this together. The only problem is, is that we have these, these frameworks for um, enumerating these kinds of vulnerabilities or these products, but there's not a lot of adherence or, um, sorry, um, hard regulations around how we use this. It's a very flexible system and it works fairly well uh, when treated well, but there's a lot of inconsistently inconsistency across the, uh, um, across the uh, whole space about how we use CDs, how we report them, how we link them to products that they um, uh, apply to, et cetera. So let's look at some of these, all right? Are CPEs just complete products? Is it your whole camera system? Is that whole device one product, a CPE? Are the component systems in there, you know, your optics and stuff like that? Are, are, are the system on chips that are running on there, is that a CPE? Should that be have its own product entry into that database? Um, are there libraries within it? Are you using OpenSSL? That's great. But what about libcrypto that lives within it? Is, is, could that be separate from OpenSSL? Could that be its own product? Um, so there's a, an awful lot of questions that we need to answer with all that. So if we look at something like OpenSSL, uh, it's a, you know, it's a commercial grade secure sockets layer. Um, it also has cryptographic libraries in it. If you go to the NVD, the database, and look up OpenSSL because you want to find out what product it relates to, because maybe you found a vulnerability, um, OpenSSL brings back 405 results. Now, every single version of that software is going to be another result. So 405 is not necessarily all the different types of OpenSSL, but there are several. So here's a few examples that come back with OpenSSL. So the very top one is usually what we think of as OpenSSL. It's a C, C++ library um, that is compiled into uh, a lot of Linux systems and stuff with Open with OpenSSL included. Um, 0.9.7 was particularly vulnerable. There's a lot of different CVEs on there, 0.9.8, 1.0.1, et cetera. So there's a lot of different versions of that. Those star fields um, we'll just kind of gloss over for now, but those are further ways that you can enumerate or specify what specific uh, product this is if there's a lot of different versions, betas, uh, alphas, different platforms, et cetera. But what are all these other CVEs or CPEs that we see out there? We see um, this Calderon Pi Open SSL. So the first part um, is our vendor. The second part is the actual product. So uh, we have this Pi Open SSL. I guess we can make a guess that that would be a Python binding for OpenSSL or a Python library. Um, then we have Lua OpenSSL on the next line. So we guess maybe that's Lua script. Um, but then look at the next two. We have uh, Node OpenSSL. Um, and if you go all the way down to the Node.js, that's the target software that it's targeting, not the language, but the target software, which is it's, it's written for Node.js, right? Um, so it's a JavaScript module written for Node. But the very next line, OpenSSL.js project, OpenSSL.js. So you have Node OpenSSL, and then you have OpenSSL.js, and you have Node.js at the end. So now you have some someone who's writing for Node that has their own way of specifying, but you have two different competing libraries, which one is which. And then you go down to the last one, OpenSSL project, OpenSSL. Well, now that looks an awful lot like the first one, OpenSSL. So which one is that? Well, the hard part is, is we really don't know. And if you dig into the metadata about this and you actually go to the, the, the web page, uh, the title doesn't help you very much, OpenSSL project, OpenSSL. Um, you know, so we go into the references and in the change log, we see a GitHub reference there. And in there we have a Rust OpenSSL. And if you go in there and you look at these different things, you have these keywords of Rust. Ah, that's for the Rust language, okay? So finding qualified prod, uh, prod, uh, platform, sorry, CPEs, can be a real challenge. The other thing that's a real challenge here is we don't know between CPEs what relates to each other. Does, um, does this Rust language depend on OpenSSL of a certain version 
uh, the C, C++ version of the first line to be a certain version, right? Does 092 map to 097 or 097A or 1.01? We don't have these kinds of interrelations. So not only is generating a, uh, an SBOM difficult, but developing a body of ground truth around an SBOM is extremely difficult. And it, it's, it's, um, it's not a problem that you think of because you think it should be obvious, but who owns that? Does the company, is it the company's responsibility to, um, to add their, their platform to the CPE database so that if vulnerabilities are found against it, that there's reliable data there? Or is it the CVEs who find the vulnerabilities? Is it their job to correctly find and identify the platforms if they're not there? So um, that's just a little background here on the CPE system. Um, they're, they're good systems to start off with, but we need more on top of that. We need some ground truth. Uh, we need some ways to relate this. Um, by the way, there are some projects that are starting to put these together, um, but it, it's, it's hard. Do you scrape the apt get repos for uh, what components are in OpenSSL or uh, HTTP servers? You know, certain HTTP servers rely on OpenSSL. Which versions go with which? Well, um, if you're installing it, you know because you look at the README for the HTTP uh, installer, right? And it'll tell you which versions you have. But we don't have any way of systematically obtaining any of that information. Okay. So let's go to a specific example of a vulnerability and let's look at the supply chain here. Uh, we'll go with an old example. Um, this is from four years ago. Um, I'm not going to try to butcher uh, Robert's last name, but Darconius, he uh, released a write-up on a router backdoor that he had discovered uh, originating from a version of OpenWRT, an open source you know, router operating system from at that point was 10 years ago, was 10 years in the past. So um, there was this backdoor hash that's down in the pseudocode below. 1D, 6, 8D, whatever. If you entered in that on the command line, you immediately got a root shell and you can see the relevant code there. Um, the problem is, is this was just in an open WRT version uh, that was 10 years old from, so I guess, 2006, right? But the, the write-up that he had was, this was not on an open WRT router. This was on a commercial router that had included open WRT and its libraries, and we're using components such as this component script called logon.sh as a part of their um, as a part of their um, operating system. All right. So Darconius found the backdoor in one or two sets of devices. Him and um, and if you read through the comments, they different people were chiming in. Oh, I just tested it against this, and I found it on this and this. So we found you know in the comments three, four, maybe five models of devices listed. Um, but how is Darconius supposed to know and go out and find, is it his responsibility to go find every single device that this uh, relates to? Is it even his um, obligation to go to the manufacturer of this device and tell him, hey, I found this in there? Um, if you go and you look for that this CVE, you don't find this CVE in, an, in the database. What's if you go even further to the CPE, the platform for this device that he he looked for, you don't even find CPEs that are related to this specific device. So, um, and this is not a small device. This is a this is a this is a device that made its its rounds, and you can you can find it different places. Um, so, whose responsibility is it? In our data set, when we've looked at all of our firmware just sitting around. We just did a string search for um, that magic hash, and lo and behold, we found 3,810 files that had this hash in it. And it wasn't just the hash, it was the full login script. But notice the file name, CLI2, factoryboot.sh, login.sh. So the original login.sh was a part of the original package, but we found the actual login.sh encapsulated in a binary called a command line interface, a CLI, or even two, that was used by web servers and stuff on IoT devices that still ran the same code from 2006 that nobody, I'm sure nobody knows, is in there. The, the manufacturer doesn't even know it's there anymore. Um, 
And the thing is, is that three major vendor companies have this, 44 different product models and 281 versions of this firmware. So this open WRT login.sh, this, this hash has made its way into many, many, many different vendors. This isn't just one person accidentally downloading it and putting it in. This is the supply chain of people uh, taking from A, who takes from X, who takes from Y, and it multiplies. So this is the heart of the problem. This is this is why we're in the bind that we're in, is the supply chain, okay? We'll do one more example before we get into the more juicy stuff, the statistics that we found. Um, this latest CVE, CPE that, uh, that we're talking about is Ripple 20. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. 19 zero-day vulnerabilities amplified by the supply chain. Its title says it all, all right? And this was two months ago that this was, or so, was reported, and according to their uh, white paper on it, this affects hundreds of millions of dev devices or more, includes multiple remote code execution vulnerabilities, all right? So that's the worst kind of vulnerability that you'd want to have. Um, many other major international vendors suspected of being vulnerable in medical, transportation, industrial control systems, et cetera. So my previous example kind of laid the groundwork for how something like Ripple 20 um, exists. All right. So let's just take one of the CVEs as an example that they reported. All right. So this was published uh, June, la uh, two months ago, June 17th, 2020. Uh, this, the description of it, the trek TCP IP stack before this version allows remote code execution related to IPv4 tunneling. Okay. So this is a vulnerability. They said it's bad. There's a base score of 10 critical on here because of the remote code execution um, and how easy it is to theoretically get access to this TCP IP stack. If we look at the CPE that is related to so all CVEs, have all the CPEs that are related to them, we find these four Trek versions are all rolled up underneath this Trek stack CPE. The problem is, is when we look for this Trek stack and we go back to or we click on the actual record in the CPE database, we find the quick info is that the CPE for this Trek stack was created almost a month after the vulnerability was discovered. All right, so there was no product for TC for Trek TCP. We had to invent, uh, not we, but the, the the vulnerability researchers had to invent the CPE that even belonged to the Trek stack, right? Um, and then we go back to our original problem. If you have this Trek library and you're trying to figure out where all it's um, where all it's at in the world you've got to kind of do some detective work. And they did some detective work because we don't have any CPE to CPE relationships. And even if we did, this CPE didn't even exist. Nobody even knew that Trek TCP ex exists. So I kind of uh, imagine uh, reading through the paper about this, um, I almost imagine uh, Luis from Ant-Man 2 um, when he's being uh, interviewed, where is Scott, you know? And I kind of imagine him talking about, you know, hey, Luis, where's Trek? And he goes, hey, man, mm, see, that's complicated. See, Trek, there's some smart guys, but they, they need some help, right? So they go to Elmic Systems, and they're like, hey, we need some uh, developers. And Elmic Systems is like, yeah, we think you, you got it going on, so let's get together. And so they started working together for some. But then something happened, and like, nah, homie, we're split. We're out of here. So Trek goes off on their own way, and Elmic Systems go off on their own way. And Trek be like, mm, we got the Trek TCPIP stack. We're going to market to all this in the United States. And Elmic Systems are like, no, homie, we're no longer the Elmic Systems. We're Zook and Elmic. And we got the Casago TCP. IP. I know it sounds like yours, but it's better because it's been renamed. And you think you got T, uh, uh, USA and you think you're all hot? Mm, homie, dang, we got all of Asia that we're going through. Meanwhile, you got security researchers in the middle of the light going, hey, can you just tell me where Trek is? And Trek is like, mm, see, it's complicated. And they go to Zook and Elmick and, 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 and see, they're just like Drake. They're like, 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 where, where's, where's this Casago at? And we can't even figure it out because the legal system is cutting us out. Whereas Trek is back here going, let's see, I got an uncle's girlfriend, boyfriend who, uh, who had a relative named HP. And, uh, it's kind of like the, like the Rona virus, like, right? Like, like, where's the contact on this? Like, uh, tracing and, and, and their uncle's second cousin once removed is named Aruba. 
And I think we were at a party together. And meanwhile, Zook and Elmick is like, and Jason is just like, where is this? And Zook and Elmick and Trek and all these people can't find out. And they're like, it's what I'm trying to say. It's complicated. <laughs> right? I'm sorry. I probably butchered that. But I can imagine industrial control systems uh, and industrial um, uh, plants that, that have SIP-13 um, investigators or, or um, people coming in, I can see their first slide to the SIP-13 auditors are going to be this picture of Luis and two words, it's complicated, right? Because it is trying to find out where this track TCP stack was, uh, according to this paper, pretty nuts, okay? So anyways, it was developed somewhere in the in the 90s to 2000. Uh, it was included in a large quantity of firmware for devices. There's been various patches to it. Some of the Ripple 20 CBEs that were even disclosed were pa patched in versions as far back as 2009. So you're a vendor. What, what products of yours contain this TCP IP stack? How do you know? How do you update a device when a patch is present or even know what version of the Trek stack you used to have in your device? How serious is the threat to your device, right? Maybe, maybe, it's not, um, maybe it's not that problematic. Maybe it was just included but never used. So reproducing CVEs are problematic. The actual attack vectors are really hard to classify in these individual products. You potentially waste time from vendors on trivial vulnerabilities that really aren't practical. Um, so really the bottom line for vendors are, how much money do you spend trying to find out whether you have to develop firmware patch for software that you don't even know is in your device? Or how likely is the software that it's even going to be exploitable, right? So it's a hard, hard question. So I'll come back to the software bill of materials here um, in a little bit. But uh, just for right now, let's make a little shift over into our um, database. And let's look at some of the vulnerability statistics that we have here. Um, hopefully you guys find this enlightening. Um, I certainly did. This is just kind of represents a slice of um, uh, the industry. We have medical devices. We have um, uh, I information control systems uh, gear. We have um, all sorts of different sectors represented and verticals in our data sector. So here we go. All right. So Etsy resolve popular name servers, 127.001, not Surprising is one of the top ones. We got some Google addresses there, 8888, um, and then uh, the next three down there that you see, 168, are all Asian DNSs. Uh, and then you've got some strange uh, noise in there, 192168, someone.com, a uh, couple others, corporate. But so, um, you know, if you have all these devices and they're going to the U.S., and they have Asian um, uh, domain servers, you're gonna have a performance hit or vice versa. How do you know where these products are going and which name servers are hitting? Um, I saw some forum posts about 192.168.0.7. Maybe the people who um, made Resolve dot, or this Etsy Resolve had it on test and they were just copy and pasting from a forum into this file. Someone.com, that actually was one vendor but it's on a whole slew of firmware for all sorts of different products in their product line. So you can see not only uh, is that illustrative that someone has just put that in as an example and they found that example somewhere, but it's in all their Etsy results and they just copy and paste that file into all their other firmware, right? So where's the checks and balances on what's actually running in there? Um, even stuff like corp ubnt.com corp.ubnt.com doesn't exist but it's running on a device as a resolve so if someone um, decides to turn up that host name and then start serving requests on there you could have some interesting results right here's another one tty count in at C secure TTY. So if you look at the bottom, uh, Etsy C T secure TTY file allows you to specify which TT devices uh, a root user is allowed to log in on. So let's just make one thing clear. Once you have an IoT device in production, you probably shouldn't be logging into that device at all. All right. So most normal operation shouldn't allow anybody from the outside to ever be tunneling into that device remotely. Um, certainly not a root user. OK, so I want to highlight this 196, uh, 148. Uh, so what that means is that these counts are the number of shells or sorry, the number of TTYs 
listed as approved TTYs that Root can log into. So 1,486 firmware have file has an Etsy secure TTY in it with 196 approved TTY locations for Root to log in on. All right, so I tracked this one down because this, this file is just like, where is this anomaly from? And I found a Yocto project, which is a way to programmatically or to easily generate a Linux operating system custom build for your project. And this particular file that I found was from 2013. So here is a supply chain, someone who's building and wants a secure TTY. They pull down this file that's pretty permissive, probably for development purposes and not really supposed to be for production. And yet here it makes its way into all these devices. So here's the supply chain in action, all right? Number of valid login shells, okay? So this is uh, in Etsy shells, this is a this is the number of, um, acceptable different types of shells that you can log in from, and most have one. So again, whether you should have a shell that people can log into or not, that's questionable, but at least a lot of them, majority of them have only one. But then we have this 10 login shells. And I guess what they want by this, a uh, little tongue in cheek, is uh, you know if their hackers are coming in and are used to have all their key bindings in their environment files for Bash, they want to make it easier for them. So they're just going to throw in Bash in there. And if you're Ash or, or ZSH, we got you covered. You can log in however you want. Um, again, a little tongue in cheek, but that's what that number represents. Um, an additional thing here that was kind of concerning is, is when I got delved into the actual um, types of devices that this was, it was over 60 of these were models of patient monitoring health systems. Okay, so over 60 different models, which represents however many thousands or hundreds of thousands of um, health systems, patient monitors that are sitting bedside have 10 or so login shells that somebody could log in with, right? These are just configuration examples in the supply chain. I'm not saying these are actual uh, vulnerabilities. They're just interesting anomalies from the supply chain, okay? So here's a question we'll configs. We're, gonna, we're, we're about out of time, so we're just gonna go through these quick. Firmware where the root user has a login shell, 15,345, all right? So 30% of all of our firmware that we looked at has some sort of login shell. Whereas if you don't want the root to log in, use sbin login, guess how many over under? One, we found one firmware that actually had sbin no longer in there, okay. Firmware with keys and authorized keys. Now this is a bad back door because this basically says if someone SSHs into your box, if your key matches their key in the authorized keys, you get to log in without any password. So this is a classic back door, whether it was purposefully put there or not, what's the over under? 175, 175 firmware. Remember, this is firmware, however many devices this represents. This is 12 different vendors with, with these keys, all right? And uh, over 29, these were really interesting known hosts to see where these kind of came from and, and the different uh, medical facilities and different places that had known hosts coming from them. Uh, Clam AV, only four, four uh, firmware had any kind of a open antivirus software. Firmware running HTTPD with mod auto index. Um, so this auto index is um, is a way to auto index f uh, files on your web browser or your web server when there isn't any kind of match for the HTML name. So it's a great way to kind of troll through your directories. So these are, um, again, things that are questionable that are in our configs. Um, firmware starting T, uh, TTY and init tab. So quite a few uh, firmware are starting TTY, um, but not that many distinct files. So here we're seeing amplification in the supply chain of here's 63 files, but these 63 files are found in 4,729 devices. Um, here's a particularly bad one, firmware with PHP to default to display errors, 332 firmware. So uh, using SQL injection or any, any kind of command injection, I love when developers leave on their display errors because when I made a mistake, it tells me exactly what's there. The problem is, is that PHP by default allows display errors. You have to explicitly turn it off. So maybe we should be uh, making software that doesn't have defaults that are vulnerable like this in their default configuration. All right, next part. 
firmware with insecure default DES encryption. So if you don't specify the type of encryption for your passwords, you're going to use DES, which is a bit weaker, 318 firmware, 29 files. But even worse, there were firmware that specified the flag to turn on MD5 as their password crypt. It was 12 firmware. Fortunately, it's small, but there's still 12 firmware. I have no idea where those are at, uh, but they're out there. Firmware with a master.password with no password on root. So in the password file, there is no over under on 100 devices, 10 devices, a million devices. No, only seven. But still, one file made its way in with no password on the root. MySQL binding to 0000. So listen to the world and allow people to go right to your MySQL. 26 devices. Firmware with Redis, the same way. Default world bind. So if you don't specify a bind by default, it will allow you in. Three, it's only one file, but still three firmware allow you into their Redis by default. Um, average number of unsafe function calls per firmware. So this one is any unsafe function calls is um, stuff like stir copy, mem copy, all those uh, unbounded ones like Ripple 20 found and stuff like uh, malicious ways to use standard allocation functions without checking links and stuff like that. How many do you think in per firmware? 1,500 and some average unsafe function calls per firmware, okay? Number of firmware with the unsafe function calls? 23,000, that's over 50, 50%. And those are the ones that we've named. We haven't even uh, trolled through those with function hashing and stuff to find the unlabeled ones that also uh, uh, call these, all right? Firmware, here's the last one. Firmware exporting NFS mounts to the world, all right? Over under on this one, 42. There are four files that um, contribute to 42 firmware mount to the world, such as slash root, mount a star, read, write. So you can, as root, write to root as user ID zero. So these are all questionable configs that have made it their way, just fun things that I found trolling through. And finally, what it, would a talk like this be without um, talking about the f common passwords and, and all that? So you see here amplified here again is the supply chain where you have the file counts of all those are the light orange. And then the dark orange is actually how many firmware use those files in them. And the, the number one being admin. It's only in five files in the password file. But those five password files are found in 470 uh, firmware, which may represent hundreds of thousands of devices where we've cracked the password admin. I'm going to give you 10 to 1 guess what the password is going to be for that admin user. All right. So anyways, in conclusion, it's all about the software bill of materials. Drive towards generating and validating these. This is the path forward. Manufacturing, implementing software inventory systems, being um, uh, developers being diligent and reporting all the components used in their systems, consumers having a high demand uh, or having a high standard in transparency and favor companies and buying from companies with that info as well. Policy makers who help guide um, these unified standards and reporting and formats um, and our security community here, developing tools to assist in the automation of the inventory. Uh, if we're doing the same thing now in five years, we're going behind. We should be using machine learning. We should be using tools and other things to help us uh, inventory and validate these things, not just on the front end, but on the back end to validate patches and updates are what they say they are and they contain what they think they, they think they contain. So thanks to all my team at Finite State and um, a lot of good research that's been in the industry. Um, finally, um, obviously the question and answer on this session are going to the Discord, but uh, I've had a fun time talking to y'all. Peace out. Hope you enjoy the rest of DEF CON and IoT Village. Thank you so much for having me.